Welcome to Netflix. I'm Isabel Perry, and on this episode, we will binge watch documentaries and majors that were produced for the 31st annual MOVE contest. MOVE stands for Massachusetts Organization of Video Educators. MOVE is a contest held at Showcase Cinemas in Patriot Place that all television production students participate in. Only one video from each category goes to MOVE to represent Middleborough. Up first, we have documentaries. The Last Ride chronicles the MHS football team on their road to the 2017 championship title. This video represented Middleborough at MOVE, placing fourth overall at MOVE in documentaries. Here is The Last Ride, produced by Television Production 2 student Kaylee Tobin. I'm Pat Kingman. I'm the head football coach at Middleborough High School. Hi, I'm Evan Gulish. I'm a senior quarterback. I'm Jeremy Soul, and I play running back. I'm Rob Nestor. I play center. I think it's like anything. I mean, you probably heard the 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 analogy to this before. It's it's kind of like a roller coaster, you know. Um, there's you look at the way the season goes or when it starts, and you've got that excitement of like you're climbing up the hill, and then there's that first day of practice you get the top, and you get that excitement of going down, and then there's some turns and some twists and some spirals, and back up and back down again throughout the whole season, and then. You know, you get to a point where you're like, you're like, I don't want to do this anymore, and your head's shaking around, and then you get to the end of the ride, and you're like, all right, let's get back on and do it again, you know? So, I mean, that's that's pretty much how, how, how it went. Kind of joked about going to Gillette, like, all summer, and especially in passing league and everything, but it, it really didn't feel real real till we got there. But the thing about going to the Super Bowl was, like, always every team's, like, hypothesis, I guess I should say. Like it's every, what every team dreams of doing, no matter like if you're like good or bad, they always want to get there. But like we knew that, not even at the beginning of the season, like a couple of years ago, that we just have like the chemistry as teammates and we just get each other that our offense and defense would just flow and that we'd like score a lot of points and win games and that we were just like an unstoppable force that would eventually win a state championship. So. You know, I think that all of them are, and I've said this about all the kids, they're better people than they are than they are players, you know. Um, I love Robbie. Robin's, Robbie's the most stubborn kid I've ever met in my life. Um, he was, it was either he was playing center or he wasn't going to play any position. He grew up more than any kid in, in the football program in four years. If I ever found myself at practice one day not having, like, a good practice, and, like, if coach was yelling at me all day or I would, like, have, like, bad snaps where I just wasn't, like, on top of everything that day, I'd go home and make sure that I could reevaluate myself and come back the next day and make sure I was perfect. Junior, my man Junior. Um, man, he's just a tough kid. He really is a tough kid. Um, he's a really good football player. He's a smart football player. Like, he's a savvy kid. He understands what's going on on the field, understands football really well, understands concepts. Um, he's a talented, talented kid that... Um, you know, I think this, the, the future is pretty bright for him and he hasn't even realized his full potential. The best accomplishment I could have got is when getting a ring. But um, nah, I'm just a hard-working football player. I eat, sleep, eat, eat, sleep, breathe football. Like, that's just who I am. Evan, um, boy, there, there's a kid right there that, you know, I'll give kudos to because I think he, that people don't realize the, the spot that, that he was put into. So, I mean, I'm obviously not the biggest kid, but um, I try just not to let that, I try not to let it impact my, my uh, like, performance. And, um, you know, quarterback is kind of a very mentally demanding position, and on offense we do a lot of, like, complex stuff. So it certainly helps to be able to, um, you know, use my, my smarts a little bit at quarterback. Um, Someone asked me the other day if you had to, 
if you had to choose a, a quarterback to, to win one game with, who would it be? They thought I'd say somebody else, and it's Evan Gabush. I say Friday night before the game, I couldn't sleep at all. I went to bed probably at like 12, 1 o'clock. Woke up about 5.30, not tired at all, so excited. And once we got there, started settling down a little bit, and it was go time. That was probably like the longest week of my life, just like waiting for that game. And, um, you know, I was, it wasn't, I mean, there was some nerves there, but it was more just excitement. And the night before, I just couldn't wait to, to get out there and play. And, and um, the bus ride up there, that was all I could think about. I just, wanted, I just wanted the game to start. I just wanted the game to start. I've been waiting for this like forever. Love you, coach. Love you. Love you. <laughs> Let's go. You're a great guy. You. Love you. You're a great love coach. You. You're a great guy. You. You're a huge inspiration, coach. I love you. I love you, too. I'm happy for you, coach. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Yeah, it was definitely bittersweet. Um, I mean, that's like that's how we dreamt it up, like finishing like that with a Super Bowl win, senior year, and it couldn't have got any better. Um, but at the same time, you know, you want to be happy and celebrate. But to to think about all the memories and stuff, and how far we've come, and to know that we're never gonna like suit up again and take the field as a sachem um, for football, it's it's very you know it's bittersweet, like I said. But I mean. We've been that that's just like what you dream about since you're a little kid is, is playing in the Super Bowl, especially senior year, being able to finish it off like that. I mean, this is every high school senior's dream to just like go out on like the biggest stage that you possibly can play in high school. And like to win it all is just amazing. It's like an incredible experience that like no senior or anyone who's ever been there will forget. So I was so emotional. I shed a couple of tears. It was amazing. The feeling we, uh, I had and the rest of the team had, it was just unreal. It was awesome. I, again, I think I said this a little bit before. I love this group. Those times where, where they, they made my hair more gray than it already is, you know. Um, but the one thing that I, I love about this class, probably more than any class overall from top to bottom, is their competitiveness with each other, not just against opponents, but it's if one guy does something, the next guy wants to do it better than that person, or they want to be, you know, the star of the week, or they want to, if someone else is having a good day, they want to have a better day, and, you know, that's something I'll remember about this class more than, more than anything. I think that, you know, in their minds, like, they look at it like this is just a stepping stone. I mean, this, just as a, as a group, I mean, they're funny. They're, they're, you know, you don't realize how funny they are until you kind of break them away from certain things, but they're a really funny group. Um, you know, they, they bust on each other pretty good. Um, you know, I think I say this a lot, and I don't think they really understand. I take more from them than they probably take from me. Um, you know, they, they, they make me better. They do. They make me better at, at everything, not just coaching, but just in my everyday life. Um, because they, you know, I see some things that when you have kids that you want your kids to do and emulate and some things you don't want your kids to do. And, you know, they help me become a better dad with that. And, you know, they make me understand that my wife can be pretty important to me and that sometimes I need to go home and, and do things like that. And, you know, a whole bunch of different things that I don't think they ever really realize that how much they help me too, so. You never have regret when you love doing something. When you love doing something, you never have regrets. If you love this game, if you love your teammate, if you love Middleborough, if you love anybody, you'll have no regrets. You leave it all out there. That's what it's about. That's all it is. You guys, you guys know what to do. All right? We went out there. We see the people. We saw the stadium. Let's just go have a blast. Let's have some fun. Bam on three. One, two, three. Bam!
Great job, Kaylee. Our next documentary is The Battle, produced by Television Production One student by Leanne McDonald. So I am Carrie Wagner. I'm Sue Durfee. My name's Chris Lewinique. Uh, my name is Joe McDonald. My name is Laurie McDonald, and I have breast cancer. Laurie is my aunt, and she's like a second mom to me. Laurie is my sister-in-law, my brother's wife, and um, God, I've known her since I was 15 years old. I'm 38 now. And I am Laurie's father-in-law. I have been friends with Lori since, oh my gosh, Brian and Aiden were in kindergarten. So now they're in sixth grade, so seven years. Cancer to me is obviously something foreign that has taken over your body and usually to me means that it's the death of someone which is unfortunate, as long as it can be treated if it's caught soon enough. When I think of the word cancer, I think of an uncontrollable disease that can happen to anybody. It's kind of a scary word to me, since I've had it myself. I uh, also worked in Dana-Farber Cancer Institute for 10 years, so it uh, has kind of a serious connotation to me. It's a disease that can attack you at anywhere in your body at any time in your life. And I think it's something that can be devastating or can, can really build somebody into a stronger person. I was diagnosed, confirmed in October of 2017. When I first heard the news, I was scared, worried. I didn't know what to expect. I, didn't, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I believed it, but you never think it's going to be somebody that you know, somebody that, that's close to you, you know. So it was, it, was pretty, it was pretty tough. I was worried that my sister-in-law was going to die and didn't know if it was caught soon enough to be treated. I was shocked, like thinking, I'm too young. Why me? Why, like, what did I do wrong? You know, one in eight people are diagnosed with breast cancer. And I was one. <laughs> I feel like she's a little more emotional from her health and everything else. She has to balance on a daily basis. But I feel like she's more, she has a positive outlook regardless to what she's going through. She's so, strong about it and tries to make the best of everything. Well, first was surgery, um, which was in January, a double mastectomy. And after all that was healed and taken care of, I had to um, start chemo, which wasn't initially part of my plan, the doctor's plan, but the cancer had um, traveled outside of its situated area, so it had become invasive. So instead of just the double mastectomy, I had to do, I have to do a round, a long round of chemotherapy. Actually, I have been in Laurie's shoes. Uh, as I said, it's a very scary, unsettling uh, thing to have happened to you. It's, it's, it's tough to deal with and uh, you just play the cards you get dealt and do the best you can with them. She's so strong, she doesn't even seem scared. I wouldn't just, you don't know what to expect, so I would just be worried of the unknown and with each treatment or each, anything that she has to go through, an appointment, you don't know, each one is different. I would only hope that I could be as strong as Lori and you know, just, I don't know, I've never seen anybody handle it, handle things the way she handles them, so I would hope that I could be a lot like Lori.
you know, in order to get through something like that and to be able to like handle it and take it in. I don't know what I would do, to be honest. I don't know how I would feel. I've never been faced with something like that. Um, I think it's a lot of shock. Not shock, but people don't know what to say. And it's, it's, it's the truth, it's life. It, I wouldn't know what to say. And now going through it, like, you just never imagine. And now I would know what to say to a person who's struggling more so than when I didn't experience it myself. Um, it's a totally different situation when you are it versus trying to support somebody who's going through it. She's still able to go about her day and, you know, like nothing's wrong. If you met her, you wouldn't think anything. You wouldn't think she's sick. You wouldn't think she had breast cancer. You wouldn't realize it. No, I think she's absolutely the same. I think she's, and that's what I mean. That's how amazing she is because she has not let this beat her down or break her down, change her personality or the person that she is or her heart or her soul. So, no, I think she's just, she's just Lori. How strong she is through all this. She is very, um, depressed because I mean she's had to give up a lot and change her whole entire lifestyle from this you know it's just everything has changed for her so but the strength with all the things that she's going through and that she's actually she still has a smile on her face even though she's worried and you there is some sadness through some of the things I see on Facebook or any social media of course that's going to be there just expressing expressing your thoughts that you have throughout the day when nobody is around to listen to you. Um, but for the most part, she is definitely very strong. Hmm, probably better than I did. <laughs> uh, I think she's handled it as well as anybody could expect. I think it's really humbling. You know, she's taught me a lot, and um, I can't imagine going through it. So to see how amazing she is, it's, it's made me realize that, you know, you can do anything, you can get through anything, especially if you're Lori. <laughs> oh my God, she's one of the strongest people that I know. Um, loudest, friendliest but most one of the most sensitive people I know as well. Um, but to me, somehow, things I feel like that are difficult are handed to the people that can actually handle them. And I think that she's a strong fighter and can handle this and fight through this because of her personality. She definitely speaks her mind. I love the way she just lays it on the line you know what I mean, and just says how she feels, and without disrespect, you know, but she will tell you how she feels, and it's one of her greatest qualities. Um, for me, it puts life in perspective. Uh, and it makes me realize that life is really short, and you never know. and it makes me want to be a better person. I just think that I hope Lori can be an inspiration for other women and girls that go through this, that it doesn't have to take get control of you or bring you down. And, you know, obviously mom has gone through a hard time, but she still managed to stay on top and remain herself and stay positive. So I just, I think that she's just an amazing inspiration for women. And if, you know, anybody goes through something like this, that if they could meet mom, then I think she would be a huge um, stepping stone for them as far as their healing process went. Well, she's obviously gonna kick cancer's ass, so <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> 
I love her and at the end of the day, she's gonna fight it and she's gonna win. Do you wonder what the majorettes do outside of the football season? Our next documentary is the sport of baton twirling, more than parades and halftime, produced by TV1 student Allison Connors and TV4 student Madison Walgreen. What do you think baton twirlers do? I think baton twirlers are like more like entertainment for other sports during halftime shows. It's very hard. I've tried it before. and It's very difficult, so I can appreciate everything they do. I think they learn routines. And they have to throw their batons up in the air really high while dancing and try to catch them. I know that they do some dance and they do awesome tricks with the baton. It's an athletic sport and you throw the baton up in the air. Just a bunch of spinning. Fantastic eye and hand coordination with the stick. I think it's a dance-like activity that they use a stick. They practice, they perform, they compete at competitions, and they go to show their support at, for other teams. I know they have their own events, but they also like support the school and do like halftime shows and that kind of stuff. Baton twirling is a lot different than what people actually make it out to be. A lot of times when they say, oh, so you're like a cheerleader? It's, it's a lot different from cheerleading or dancing. And so what a lot of people think of baton twirling is, oh, you march in a parade and, you know, throw it up sometimes. But major arts are really a lot more than that. We, in the high school, perform for an organization called NEMA, which is New England Major Art Association. And in this league for baton twirling, we have a bunch of different teams from all different towns, and we compete for five weeks. And the criteria that we're, the judges look for are design of the routine, costumes, props, and how well your routine and choreography goes with the music. And then from that, they pick a winner for each week, and then we have an overall winner at championships, which happens at Brockton High School. Yeah, yeah it's a lot more work than I think most people think it is, too, because like I feel like I say I'm a majorette, and people kind of like laugh, and they're like, oh, ha, ha, yeah, you, you twirl for the football team, right? And I'm like, Oh, well, I do a lot more than that. Like, outside of it, we put in hours and hours. Some, like, girls do, like, solo and other things like that. So it's like all of us put in a lot of time and energy into it, and we compete just like any other sport. Well, for NEMA, there's four levels offered. Novice, which is for people who are just starting out or have no prior experience with baton twirling. And then once people have graduated from Novice and shown the coaches that they are capable of more, they're allowed to move to Class B which is a step up from novice, and they can do harder tricks in their routine, and it's a little longer for them to perform. And then after class B is class A, and what class A is, is the kids who are intermediate to early advanced, and these kids are preparing for the, the biggest level, or the most advanced level, which is open class where a majority of our high school baton twirlers are. Yeah, people yeah. hear baton and they think, oh, you go outside and you throw around a metal stick and sometimes you light it on fire. But <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Casual. <laughs> but it, in reality, it's so much more than that. Like, there's so much physical activity involved along with, like, you have to know what you're doing or you are going to hurt yourself. It's like a lot of mind and body work all rolled up into one thing together. So when I was younger, when I first started twirling, I started twirling at a studio called Twirl Town USA. And so that's where I learned all my basic skills and I also started to compete um, at local competitions. So when you're younger and you're in elementary school or middle school, there's no, there's no half time for football or um, really parades, so you have to join a studio. So that, that was the studio that I joined as I got to high school, then I got to do the halftime shows and the parades, which is what the town sees, is the, the high school twirlers. So in every today there are many different events, such as team events, there is also two baton, three baton, and flag. There are also solo events, there is also an extra when you march to a certain pattern, in an X, that's why it's called an extra. And there's also a rhythmic twirl when you set your routine to a certain type of music. And lastly, there's also duets and trios. So it's a lot different and it has a lot more elements than what people make it out to be, which is just marching in a parade. 
I'm McKenna, I'm a freshman at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I've also been twirling for 12 years. My name's Julianne Page, and I've been twirling for 14 years. And I'm Julianne Page, I've been twirling for 11 years. And we're cousins. Yeah. <laughs> and we're my sisters. sisters. I would definitely say that twirling has made our family closer, um, especially with my aunt, my aunt Tracy, my aunt Corey. Um, seeing them at practice every day. Um, twirling's been a, basically like what our family has been like, not really based on, but that's what like our family has been about. Like it's all been about twirling. It's, it definitely rules your life. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely think that twirling has made our family as a whole closer just because it definitely brings in something in common. And, yeah, um, that's what I was trying to yeah. say. <laughs> it's a major thing in our lives that is like what we have in common and it's really what we can bond over. My aunt had mentioned, oh, you should do baton twirling classes. And so I think if my aunt wasn't a baton twirler, I would have never known what it actually was. Having a, my older sister be a baton twirler did inspire me to follow in her footsteps. I would always go to her practices because she needed to watch me and nobody else was home. And I just picked up a baton and the passion like started. If it wasn't for our aunt or if it wasn't for my mom's also a coach, then I probably wouldn't have been in the program. One opportunity that um, I like to talk about is um, the Rose Bowl Parade. So um, because we were part of the, the marching band, the marching band got um, invited specially to march in the Tournament of Roses Parade. So that's a parade that's um, it's done every year on New Year's and it's leading up to the Rose Bowl. So that was a really cool opportunity. With MBTA, we've gotten so many opportunities to travel. For example, I've been to St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. I've also been to Florida, Georgia, Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine, as well as competing here in Massachusetts for our regional competition. So I've, I've gotten so many opportunities to travel all over the country and make so many new friends in the sport of baton twirling. We got to perform in Disneyland. We did um, a parade through the park and it was honestly, it was so fun to see all, really the little, cool. all the little kids, like so excited to see us. And it was like, they, they honestly looked up to us and it was mm -hmm. like when we had to like stop and do like our performance, it was, I was right in front of a kid and the whole time she was just like, Oh my gosh, that's so cool! And I was like, like it's it's those things that make you think that like you're inspiring somebody else. And it was to do something in Disney where it's so magical. It was it was great. I think my ultimate favorite has to be my yearly trip to AYOP, which is our nationals, which is located in South Bend, Indiana, at Notre Dame University. There's people from all over the country, and then sometimes even all over the world, who compete at this competition. Your first time twirling out on a field is so amazing in front of all those people, and having the marching band behind you, it's it's such an amazing um, moment. And so I think I was really, really excited to see McKenna experience that. And I was like, oh, she's gonna have so much fun. <laughs> Twirling has probably meant like everything to me just because I was just practically born into the program. I was at practices before I was even born with my mom and then I just sort of grew up with the program so it, it taught me everything I know. Twirling's really taught me um, how to be confident and it's definitely um, a social aspect of my life too. I've made a lot of my friends um, through twirling. I twirl five to six days a week most weeks and that's where I see all my friends that's where I've met many of my friends and we've all just been so close for so long. Twirling's been everything to me I've been doing it since I can remember and my mom did it so carrying it on from you know what she did as a kid it's been really great. <laughs> Twirling has impacted my life quite a lot I spend the majority of the hours of my week when I'm not in school I'm pretty much twirling on open. <laughs> I've learned so many life lessons from twirling that I'm very grateful for, such as dedication, teamwork, and perseverance. Because some days in the gym when you hit yourself, it's really hard to keep going. But when you finally catch that trick that you've been practicing, it just it feels really good. Twirling's, like she said, been my entire life. I started when I was six. And it's really sad that I'm a senior and it's coming to a close. Twirling has meant so much to me. 
and the both of us. The both of us, yeah. And honestly, I don't think neither of us are actually going to let it go. Not yet. Well, I won't let it go. As you can, you don't need a friend. What does money mean to you? That was the essential question behind TV Pro One student Mandy Bukunt's documentary titled Money. Let's take a look. If I had a million dollars, I would go to Greece. I would put it in the bank. If I had a million dollars, I think the first thing I would do is probably go on a trip with my friends and family. Like I've always wanted to go to Ireland because that's where my family's from, so. Maybe just book my dream trip to Turks and Caicos, and the rest of it would just stay there until another rainy day. The first thing I would do if I had a million dollars is I would donate to a reputable charity, something meaningful to myself and my family. The first thing I would do if I had a million dollars is probably put it in the bank to invest in college and like my further education. I get most of my money from my parents, or during the holidays, I'll get gift cards, or during my birthday. Um, I get most of my money from my parents and from holidays. My dream job is a makeup artist for celebrities. Because makeup is a passion, and I love celebrities. My dream job is to be a vet for exotic animals. Okay, so my dream job is that I've always wanted to be a chef or like a restaurant owner, but I've also either wanted to own a business or something like that. I've always loved spending time with animals and I like to have pets, so I feel like it'd be really cool, especially with exotic animals. I'd like to say that I don't really spend my money that much unless it's like a gift card and I'll spend it on clothes. I mostly just save it and put it into my bank account. The one piece of advice I would give my high school self is make the most of every day, take advantage of your opportunities, and really push yourself academically. It'll pay off when you're in college, and when you look back, you'll realize just how fast time went. I think the advice I would give my high school self is to believe in your capacity um, to do great things and to ask for help when you need it. One piece of advice that I would give my future self is to not worry about how much money you have and focus more on how happy you are. Uh, be happy. Don't screw up. I would give my high school self the advice to never walk away. A lot of the times when I was in high school, there'd be mean girls, there'd be situations that you'd walk away from instead of defending yourself. One thing that you cannot put a price on is health. I cannot put a price on my health or my children's health. I feel like happiness and like friendship and family. I cannot put a price on is love and friendship. One thing in the world you cannot put a price on is your family, friends, and your integrity. A family and love making memories. Like that has to be, that all comes like from the heart and you can't really put a price on it. In your life right now, do you think that money can buy you happiness? No. Right now in my life, I feel like it, it could go either way. The majority of stress that I have right now is all money related. How am I going to pay for Peter's college? How am I going to do certain things definitely buy me happiness. I don't think money could buy me happiness just because I like spending time with my family and friends. I feel like I don't need money to be able to do that. I think the people that you have in your life makes you happy. Happiness is not um, based on monetary value. It's, it's a matter of what you do with the time you have here. Money is a necessary evil. It gets me things that I want. I've got to work hard for it keeps you grounded. Right now what money means to me is a retirement fund, um, my children's college fund. Right now money does not equal happiness. Money is a tool. It's a tool for living. You have to have it. You can't live without it because it gets you the things you need like food, shelter, 
like in the future people are going to keep worrying about their money and they just need to like stop and take a step back and like really appreciate what they do have and be more grateful about it. And money is that, as long as you treat it as a tool and that you're easy come easy go, don't put too much emphasis on it because then your decisions in your life will be um, not done in ways that will be good for you. Um, money means, I don't know, it's just a, just an item. Thank you for watching Netflix. Today's episode features documentaries and majors produced by Middleborough High School television production students. Our last documentary today is titled The Life of Mylon, produced by TV2 student Sarah Boget. My name is Kate Rondelli, and I am 42. Um, I'm originally from upstate New York, and I moved to Washington, D.C. in 2001 to help my sister out um, and be my nephew's nanny. Um, and during that time, I got a part-time job at the 930 Club, which is where I met Paul Rondelli. Um, we became really good friends and then we fell in love and we were together for about 11 years. Um, and it was amazing and we had two beautiful children, Piper and Mylon, and then we lost him four years ago to a car accident. It was a busy life, um, you know, one mom, two kids. Um, you know, it was a normal life, just school and work and play, um, and I think, you know, it's just like everybody else. You, you do your normal things and you have fun, and he was a toddler, he was two years old before he was diagnosed, so it was already hectic. <laughs> Having a toddler is hectic. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we had a good life. So. For a week or two before Mylon was diagnosed, he was having more behavioral issues, just really irritable and cranky, and it was hard to tell if that was just him changing at being a toddler. He was two, so two-year-olds can be irritable and cranky. Um, the big thing that I noticed was his increased um, thirst and increased urination. His diapers were getting fuller and fuller. Um, so about a day, day and a half before he was diagnosed, um, I started keeping track of like how many sippy cups he was drinking, um, you know, his intake, and it was a really large amount. Um, so that threw up red flags to me because I've had diabetic pets, um, and that was how I diagnosed my first diabetic cat, was he was peeing more, he was drinking more. Um, and then just something didn't feel right. You know, Mylon just wasn't his happy self. He was just really grumpy. Um, and so I called his pediatrician and she said, come right in. And we went in and um, they, they tested his blood sugar. They pricked his finger and checked his blood glucose and he was in the 500s. Um, and he was dehydrated and she said, um, you're going to get back in the car and immediately go to the emergency room. Um, so we decided to go to Children's Hospital because it was close to our home and it's an amazing um, hospital. Um, so they admitted us right away and started treatment. You know, it's, it's changed our family a lot. Um, there's a, for a parent, there's a constant fear. You're, you're, any parent is always going to be fearful that their child's going to get hurt. Um, but with an uncurable disease, there's just a constant fear of something's going to happen. I feel very blessed that he hasn't had any major, um, you know, he hasn't had any hospitalization time since his diagnosis. So I feel that we've really done a good job at learning about the disease, maintaining, you know, his food intake, maintaining his insulin, um, but it's really hard. It's a, a non-stop, you're always doing something, we're always paying attention. And then for his sister, you know, she, he gets a different type of attention and that's hard on 
a sibling as well. Um, even though she's really a great helper, it still affects the family dynamic. So it, it's hard. It's really hard. You know, she, in the beginning, you know, we were all nervous and didn't know really what to expect. But over the last two years, she is such a cheerleader for her brother. If he's having a bad day, if he's running high, if his numbers aren't regulated, um, she finds ways to um, make sure he's active or will play a game or give him extra attention or um, if he's just upset about something, she's just really loving and really is my helper. You know, she's, she's in it, you know, with us. So it's a day-to-day lifestyle and she finds ways to to help comfort him in ways that I don't think I can and as a sister she's just a really great big sister to him. This is Slash. He is Mylan's diabetic service dog um, and the reason we got him um, was his nose is a very special nose. He's trained to alert us if he is too high or too low, if his blood glucose is too high or too low. Um, so for me, I felt that we're one such an animal family anyways. We all of us have had pets and um, our whole family are advocates of animals and their well-being. Um, I think, you know, even with technology and these devices that Mylan has, it's one extra step, someone else looking out for Myland that can sense something that I can't or a machine can't or when he's at school someone may not notice. So it's just a, another set of eyes, a nose, <laughs> to really help us make sure Myland is safe. Um, a CGM is a continuous blood glucose monitor. Um, so it is inserted subcutaneously into myelin skin. Um, there are four different places that he wears it. So every time we change it, we change it weekly. Um, it's inserted either into his um, upper thigh, so the right or left, and then his um, outer arm. Um, so every week we rotate this continuous blood glucose monitor and that um, reads his blood samples um, and it wires, wirelessly then communicates to a device um, that I wear or that is within 20 to 30 feet of him. Um, and it helps us know where he is. It's not exact. It's not like a finger prick but it gives us a range to know, oh, he's going high, we need to exercise him, or he's going low, he needs to eat. It's just a helpful tool. Um, sometimes it's a love-hate relationship because it's it's painful, it's a lot of upkeep, it's, it's also um, sometimes wrong. <laughs> um, but I don't see our life without it. It's helpful enough that we'll continue to use it. You know, every diabetic parent's hope is there's a cure. Um, there's amazing research teams out there. Um, there's amazing people doing amazing things with, you know, medications and all of these devices that help. But the ultimate goal is the cure for type 1 diabetes. It's been around for so long, and I really hope in his lifetime that he doesn't have to live with it for the rest of his life. But if he does, I really want um, him to understand his disease and it doesn't make him different as a kid. You know, he can play with his friends, he can, you know, play sports, he can be active. You know, this disease is not going to keep him from being himself, but he also has to take care of himself. Um, so, you know, as he gets older, I really think that he will understand the importance of knowing what he's eating, taking his medication, um, tracking his blood sugars, you know, so my goal is to set him up so as he grows up, um, he'll be able to properly take care of himself um, and really understand his diabetes, but ultimately we want a cure.
Those were some excellent documentaries. Up next, we will be watching videos produced for the major category. A major is a video that is a fictional video between 5 to 10 minutes. Up first, we have a mockumentary about two infamous brothers. The Gillage Brothers was produced by TV4 student Sean Rutledge and placed second at MOVE this year. Jeez, the Gillage Brothers, now those two, they could really make a film. Whenever success in the film industry are regarded to you together, I can't help but reminisce on the days of the Gillage Brothers and the movie empire they had created. The two of them were probably the craziest, goofiest, wildest directors Hollywood has ever seen. Yet everything they did worked. To think that despite the huge success the two had shared together, they still threw it all away. And that still baffles me to this day, that the two brothers could turn their backs on each other. Hello? Who are you guys? Oh, documentary team. Yeah, no, come in, come in, come in. You guys all set? You need anything? You good? All right. Let's get the show going the road. What's the deal with this thing? <sighs> Hello, I'm Gordon Gillage. I live in the beautiful Santa Barbara, California. Welcome to my house. And I guess you guys wanted to talk to me about my successes in the film industry. Yeah, I haven't seen Greg in, I don't know how long. Definitely a few years, but I don't know. He's, he's doing his thing, I'm doing my thing, so I guess, I guess it doesn't really matter. Please don't hurt me. I don't have anything. The squirrels took everything. They took all my food and money. <laughs> Wait, what is this? I'm Greg Gillage, I'm 34, and I want to be the next Bachelor in Paradise. No? Oh, oh. I'm Greg Gillage, I'm 34, and I'm a co-founder of the Gillage Brothers Filming Group. I guess living on the streets isn't too bad. Uh, the weather's nice sometimes, uh, the dumpsters always have goodies in them, uh, and the squirrels, well, the one thing you need to know about the squirrels is if you don't respect them, they're gonna disrespect you. I learned that the hard way. Yeah. Ah, old G&G. &G. Yeah, we were really close friends during kindergarten, all the way out through high school. We were like this. No, wait. The three of us. Yeah, Eugene. He was a great asset to our movies. Always willing to take one for the team. I suppose willing wasn't the right word. I guess you can say we're a couple goofballs. I made a few movies with them. I usually play the role of the stuntman. I got shot in the head with a BB gun, that hurt. I got hit by a car and broke both my legs. At one time, they called the cops on me and told them I had a hostage in the house. I got tased a bunch, but now that I think about it, I don't think that was for a movie at all. Did you talk about the time we called the cops on them? That's <laughs> so classic. Were their methods unethical? Probably, maybe. Yeah, that made all the difference when they became big and famous. From what I understand, they had a rough upbringing, right? Single mom, two jobs, you know the deal. But that all changed after high school when a little man known as Steven Spielberg came into the picture. Spielberg came to Boston to judge a film festival and the boys entered and they won. Not only did they win, but they got to meet Mr. Spielberg. And I guess somehow from that, a relationship formed between Spielberg and the boys' mothers. And that was their in. Yeah, we worked with them. Uh, we did that Peter Pan movie, Hook. Jurassic Park. Yeah. Ever heard of it? And of course, Saving Private Ryan, which would be our last movie under Spielberg. Then Greg came up with this really progressive idea, right? He wanted to make Private Ryan a girl. So here's the problem. I had this great idea. He wouldn't even consider it. Because he was all like, men this, men that, male producers, male leads. You want a dinosaur movie? Guess what? All male dinosaurs. No females ever. And then this man has the audacity to break up with my mother 
the woman who raised me. So the boys were back to square one. 20 something year olds, no jobs, living in their mom's basement. Two weeks. They were there for two weeks, writing scripts nonstop. And this, of course, would be what caught the eye of Jack Starr, film industry legend. The first time seeing the Gillich Brothers send in, I thought to myself, what a bunch of idiots. But then I thought, from what I saw, I can make a bunch of money off these morons. So I flew them out to Hollywood, gave them a boatload of cash, and told them to go make their first movie, Rescuing Mr. Bryant. Was Rescuing Mr. Bryant a cheap shot at Spielberg? No. Okay, maybe, but everyone loved it. Who cares? The feeling of creating something that big, there's really nothing like it. They then went on to make so many more hits. The Big Pete, instant classic. It's about this guy, Gavin, who has a secret identity, Pete. The Hot Seat, by far my favorite. Absolute tearjerker. Duke of Extremism, which is a musical about the Archduke Ferdinand. Phantom Book, that was a good one. It was about a book that brought dead ghosts back to life. And so many more. Over those short 10 years, the boys went on to direct 12 different movies, nine of which were award-winning and three of which won Best Picture. We were unstoppable. The best in the biz. <sighs> but then, there's Checkmate. Checkmate was gonna be about the 1989 International Chess Championship. Now I'm known for daunting movies, but this one, it was out of this freaking world. The movie was like a hot plate of spaghetti and the world was hungry for it. About six months into production of the film, the Gilge brothers hit a metaphorical wall. They had some uh, creative differences. I think that's enough questions. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of a touchy subject, uh, but it, it's all in the past now. Water under the bridge. The whole world knew about the hot streak they had going on, right? Then they have some little minor differences on some plot points or something, and the news gets hold, and then everybody in the business knows. And that's when he came back into the picture. Steven Spielberg. He offered us so much for that script. I mean, yeah, we had a lot of money as it was already, but this was an offer we could not refuse. So yes, I sold Steven Spielberg the rights to the film. I didn't think Greg would mind, you know, like he'd get a chunk of the bargain too, and the movie wasn't even in good shape. I mean, he did it without telling me, so yeah, I was a little upset. Uh, I know it was a boatload of money, but it's coming from the man that broke our mother's heart. So I had to leave the company. I, I, I do miss filming now. Do I ever regret handing over the rights to the film? Yeah, I mean, I lost a lot of money when I had to buy it back, so that wasn't, that wasn't fun. Here, come with me, I'll show you something. Two days after I had sold the script to Spielberg, I, I bought it back, hoping that it would also bring back Greg, but I guess he had made up his mind. Hell, I even finished the whole, whole script and everything with his ideas, but I guess there was no point to that. All right, where are the bachelorettes? What was that? Hello? 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 Where are the chicks? Hello? Hello? Where are the ladies? Oh, you are a mess. And you're not a bad for left. Come here, brother. <laughs> oh. And you know it was it was because of that 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 I'm a happy man today. So and you know so what if Checkmate got a lower rating than um The Emoji Movie? The Emoji Movie on Rotten Tomatoes, cause that doesn't matter. None of that matters. It was the driving force that brought us back together. So for that, I'm pretty thankful. It was an awful movie. Mm. Yeah, well, we, we used your idea, so. Well, it, it was your idea to, you know, have David choke on a chess piece. All right, that list, that wasn't.
What would you do to get everything you've ever wanted? Who would you make a deal with? A character in our next major is faced with that very difficult decision in a film titled Deal with the Devil, produced by TV3 students Jake Steiner, Aaron Conley, and Matt McNaughton. Yo, what even happened that night? Well, looking back at it, it's a little bit of a blur. But um, basically what happened was me and my boy, we were messing around with this idea for a while. Um, that new place uptown, we were going to have someone rob it for us. So we were out that night, and me and Tony saw this kid. He was out alone, looking kind of scared. We figured it would be too easy. I looked at Tony, and... We just knew it was about to go down. We pulled up on him, and we shook him up a little bit. Threw him in the car. We told him what was going to happen, but I guess someone was watching, and they decided to snitch on us, but whatever. It's the past now, so it doesn't really matter. So how long has it been now, like five years or something? No, it's been like seven. By far the stupidest thing that I've ever done. Can we just not talk about this right now? Yeah, no problem. I think I'm gonna go get a snack or something. Do you want something? Nah, I'm fine. Alright. So you thought it was gonna be easy, huh? Ah. Oh. What happened? Where am I? <laughs> uh. Who are you? Let's just say, from that night on, that kid wasn't normal. Okay. That still doesn't explain you, though. Why can I hear you? How can I hear you? My friend, relax. Let's just say you died, if that makes sense. Dead. That, that does not make sense. How, how the hell would I be here if I was dead? That's for you to figure out, my friend. Well, how am I supposed to do that if I'm dead? Need a hint? Yes, please, I'll do anything. Anything? Well, I guess. I mean, I'm dead, so what do I have to lose? Have you ever wanted to be able to get anything that you ever wanted? Well, I mean, who wouldn't? So you want to make a deal? What's the deal? Let's just say that I could give you what you want. That pain from your head, your criminal record. I could take that all away and give you everything you ever wanted. That does sound pretty good. What do you want for it? I just need you to sign this paper for me, and then it's all yours. <laughs> Sounds easy enough. Where's the paper? Just walk forward, please. Okay. How am I supposed to sign this if I can't even read it? Look, do you want all your wishes to come true or not? Well, what do I have to lose? Where am I? What's fruit snacks? Have this for breakfast. All right. Um, this is what I've always wished for. Check in the sock drawer. Oh. 
$10,000. Okay. Ow. Ow. What's happening to me? <laughs> My dear friend, you're experiencing the side effects of our deal. What side effects? I didn't think there were any. <laughs> My friend, weren't you ever taught to read the fine print? What fine print? Whatever. How, how do I get rid of them? Well, you did sign. Once you sign, you can't get out. That's not answering my question. Yeah, there's a reason, but uh, I actually really don't know how to get rid of them. So, am I just like a beta test for whatever this is? Uh, I guess you could call it that, yeah. Well, why me? I, I do not belong here. This is way too nice for me. Why am I in heaven? I like to work for what I get. I don't... I'm not supposed to be here. Whoever said you were in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching Netflix and a special congratulations to the videos that represented Middleborough at the 31st Annual Move Contest. Make sure to check out MiddleboroughTV.com as well as our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at MiddleboroughTV for photos and all updates about MHS. From all of us in TV Pro, I'm Isabel Perry and thanks for watching.